Welcome back to Subject to Cross. I'm your host, Caroline Donato. And I'm your co-host, Pete Kratza. And we are back in the studio by your demand, which we appreciate. Thank you so much, listeners. We received quite a lot of feedback from our last couple of episodes, and I wanted to read two emails we received. And the first is from a juror in the trial that we spoke about in episode 28. And this juror gave us permission to read the email. She gave us permission to also publicize the email with certain redactions to protect her identity. But the email was really impactful to us. And I'm going to read it. And then we'll read a subsequent email that we also received that prompts the topic of this episode. Do you want to introduce yourself? Did you say anything yet? I said I'm your co-host, Pete Kratza, but what you may want to do is just put into context what trial you're talking about. Sure. Well, episode 28 was about a trial. By the way, I'm really impressed that you can remember the episode numbers. Thank you. Hmm. Thanks for being impressed with it's something I It's the final I compliment of this episode. The trial that she's referencing is a jury trial that we had in Chester County, Pennsylvania in October of 2022. And our client in that trial, he was acquitted of everything that he was accused of because he was innocent. And he gave us permission to speak about the case. And one of the jurors, at least one of the jurors, listened to the episode and that prompted her to write us an email. And the email is entitled, Episode 28, Thank You. Good evening. My name is blank, and I have been a listener since October 2022. I served on the jury that you recently discussed on episode 28, and I was the foreperson that read out the not guilty verdict. The jury voted that the outcome should be read from one of the three women serving on the jury because they thought it would be better received that way. And Caroline, I appreciated your take on what feminism is and what it is not, exclamation point. Each detail that you discussed on the show took me back. I started listening to your podcast because of the trial. I was so impressed at the level of detail you both went through to prove your client innocent. And then she goes on to explain her experience, and she ends with this. Thank you for educating everyone on different legal topics and processes. Please continue to create episodes. Pretty cool. That was really cool. Yeah. That was really cool. And for today's episode, this is an episode prompted by another listener who asked us to talk about it. And I'll read you that email as well. And I'm going to protect the identity of all listeners who send us emails. But this listener asked us to talk about Adnan Syed. And this email reads as follows. Lifetime fan here. Episode 29 was a nice example of a fair and proper decision, as well as providing the reasoning behind the prosecution decision to decline prosecution. One of today's Baltimore Sun printed newspaper headlines included developments about the reinstatement of an earlier conviction and life sentence of Adnan Syed. My last memory on this was the prosecution withdrawing the charges and setting Adnan free. What's odd is the rationale appears based on an appeal by the deceased brother who appeared by video at the hearing that vacated the original conviction and sentence, but claims without evidence that he had, that had he appeared in person rather than video feed, there would have been a different outcome. Two of three appellate judges agreed, which doesn't sit right with me given the brother would not have been allowed to make any statements or present any evidence, severely limiting any ability of him to alter or sway any outcome of the hearing that day. Do either of you have any thoughts on this? Keep up the great work and super fun podca- podcast. So we have thoughts on this, but to give you our thoughts, which might even be a 30 second thought, hmm. I thought, and Pete agreed, we should go into the history of Adnan Syed just to catch up any listeners who might not have much of a understanding as to the history of this case. But this case was the basis for my first article at the firm. I didn't know that. Am I supposed to be closer to the mic? 
I don't know, but I sound really loud in my head. Yeah, I told you that. <laughs> but last time we were really quiet, so I'm trying to find that balance. So the case of Adnan Syed started when Heyman Lee was murdered in 1999, and her body was found in a park, and this was in Maryland. And the manner of killing Heyman Lee was manual strangulation. So she died in January 1999, and Adnan Syed was arrested in February 1999. To this day, Adnan Syed maintains his innocence that he did not kill Heyman Lee. The first trial for Adnan was in December 1999. That was a mistrial pretty quickly. The second trial was in January 2000, and in February 2000, he, Adnan Syed was convicted of first-degree murder, kidnapping, robbery, false imprisonment, and I'm sure some related offenses to that. In June 2000, Adnan Syed, I believe he was, seven, he was 18 years old by this point, was sentenced to life plus, I think, 30 years in prison. And for the next three years, he exhausted his appellate rights and he filed for post-conviction relief in 2010, and relief was denied in 2013. And then came the Serial Podcast. And the Serial Podcast prompted a nationwide, probably international, interest into this case. And the Serial Podcast is what prompted my interest in the case in that first article with the firm, which I wrote while I was still a business lawyer. Well, that's why I didn't read it. And... Syed filed successful, mo successful motions to reopen his post-conviction proceedings in 2015 to explore alibi testimony, new cell phone data, ineffective assistance of counsel claims. And in June 2016, Syed was granted a new trial, but he wasn't allowed out on bail while his conviction was vacated and he waited for a new trial. And he waited for that trial for over two years. And the Maryland Court of Appeals reversed that decision and said no new trial. And in August 2019, he asked the Supreme Court of the United States to hear his case, and they refused to, which with the sitting Supreme Court we have right now, that was probably good for him. <laughs> and we'll talk about that in another episode. And then in 2022, prosecutors investigated further, and they uncovered new evidence and the prosecution asked Maryland, a, a Maryland trial judge, to vacate Syed's conviction. And in October 2022, prosecutors announced that the charges against Syed were dropped. And in March 2023, Syed's conviction was then reinstated by an appellate court because of a procedural issue. And the court stayed the effective date of the decision for 60 days. So here's what we have. If I'm going to step back and give broad strokes. Because I wanted to give, you know, the procedural background as accurately as possible. But you have a, a young man who's convicted of murder, who asserts his innocence, who's exhausting all of his appellate claims, who then gets nation, international nationwide recognition for his case and his defenses and the evidence that was flawed, that was introduced to his trial. And then he's able to open proceedings to look at his conviction again, then ultimately, um, the prosecution, years later, agrees that that conviction, they didn't have confidence in it anymore because of the new evidence that was uncovered. The prosecution wants his conviction vacated. And once the conviction is vacated, the prosecution drops the charges. But then the family of the young lady who was murdered inserts themselves and does not like the proceeding in which the charges were dropped against Adnan Syed. Well, in the evidence, I read uh, one of these articles referenced the fact that there was DNA evidence that, um, I'm not going to use the word exonerated him, but it, the fact of the matter is that there was other DNA evidence at the scene. There was also some evidence that wasn't shared. They had developed two other suspects. Because when you read, the, there was uh, one of the things I read here was this brief from 2018, which was written by... The, the state when they were still trying to, uh, per, you know, to to keep the conviction. That was before they reopened it four years later and said, "Oh, never mind." But the evidence was pretty compelling circumstantially. Um, 
you know, that they laid out. He clearly had motive uh, and opportunity. But the, when a prosecution, when a, when a prosecutor's office takes the step 20 years later, because this was uh, 2022, to say to a judge, we think that you should dismiss, you know, find him not guilty, whatever the language was. Vacate a conviction. Vacate. You know, that's extraordinary. And there's going to have to be some pretty significant evidence that would um, cause them to doubt the, uh, the conviction. And the, 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 what the email from our listener references specifically is that in this hearing where the, they were asking a judge to, um, what was that language again? Who's asking the judge what? The prosecutors are asking oh, the judge to, vacate the, to vacate the sentence. I'm sorry, the, vacate the conviction. Vacate the conviction. They had um, the the brother of the victim um, was only given one business day's notice and appeared virtually. And now lawyers for the brother are saying, you know, that was procedurally uh, a violation of victims' rights in, in Maryland, so I should get my day in court. And initially, they're like, okay, you're going to get your day in court, and Syed has to go back to jail. Well, ultimately, all parties agreed that he doesn't have to go back to jail. Well, There's the like a stay. the prosecution and Syed's lawyers agreed. Well, so did so did the brother's lawyers. Oh, did he? Um, they agreed to this stay. Um, so now the issue is whether... You know, he he gets his day in court. The the um, brother of the of the victim, but the dynamic here, and perhaps we've talked about this before, Caroline, because I don't have an encyclopedic memory of our episodes like you do. But this is another example of in from where I sit, providing too much, too many rights, too too much say in non-lawyers in terms of an outcome of a case. Syed has lawyers. The government has lawyers. They both assess the case. They both agree the conviction shouldn't stand. The, the standing of this, of this brother, who is the brother of a victim, there's no doubting you know, that she's a victim. The issue is whether this guy did it or not. And the prosecution doesn't believe he, and they can prove that he did it anymore. I just don't understand how in a, in a criminal justice system we've gotten to that point. I understand that victims needed to be heard, victims needed to be, and victims include families of, of, of people that are deceased. Um, they need to be heard. They need to be advised of outcomes. They need to be, uh, to have voice um, sentencing issues, for instance. Well, you know, he had his day in court. He was there virtually. Nothing he said was going to change what that judge did. He wasn't a witness. The other thing that strikes me about this whole episode um, in the Syed case, no doubt the brother still thinks Syed did it because he was told by prosecutors for 20 years that they had the right person and that that person was in jail. Well, now those same Prosecutors, that same prosecutor's office is saying, we're not so sure. Which means and, the killer got away with it. Well, right. But he's never going to accept that, right? Unless there's somebody else that, that they're going to put in jail for it. And that's the danger to me of this encroachment in terms of the criminal justice system, in terms of due process, when you allow people that are so emotionally invested, who aren't lawyers, who aren't fact witnesses, who aren't actual victims, they're families of victims, to impede justice. And the fact that Syed was going to have to go back to prison due to a procedural issue about whether this guy was going to get to talk to the judge in person is, in is person outrageous. versus Zoom. But let's loop it. Because oh, God. Looping. Okay, here we go. Let's loop it. Because I think if we give some factual background to the case and give a timeline of that factual background to the procedure involved, that'll help us illustrate to the listener why we feel the way we feel. That That's why our take is the victim shouldn't have a say to that degree where it doesn't vacate a sentence, or at least he can try to 
is he can try to get in the way of a vacated conviction. So I actually found this. There's a lot of timelines out there online, but there was this biography article by Tyler Picotti and Rachel Chang, and I thought it was really helpful to jogging the memory of this case. I'm just going to pull some information from it. So Woodlawn High School senior Heyman Lee, she's found dead in Lincoln Park in West Baltimore, Maryland. And for years, everybody thought it was Adnan Syed, even though he maintained his innocence. Syed's conviction was vacated in, vacated in September 2022, but the appellate court reinstated it due to a procedural issue. I'll also say, I think the Maryland Supreme Court paused the reinstatement of that conviction while he's wait, while they're waiting to determine the, the uh, issue on appeal. So I, I'm not sure that that conviction is actually in effect right now. But here's the timeline of the facts. December 1998, Syed and Lee break up. So they had a secret relationship because of religious and cultural differences. And they dated in 1998, and they broke up in December of that year. In January 1999, Lee and, I don't know how to say his last name well, but Don Klein Dinst go on their first date. And this first date is with a lens crafter co-worker, and he's also the son of the store owner. Within two weeks of that first date, Lee disappears. And this is the date that's at issue for Adnan Syed. But there was quite a few witnesses that back in 2000 inserted themselves in a specific way. And then a witness, Asia McLean, came forward later to insert her, I'll call it an alibi of Adnan. And that wasn't heard in the initial trial. But as described by Syed to Serial Podcast, Syed on January 13th, 1999, the day Heyman Lee disappears, he goes to his photography and English classes, and then he calls his friend Jay Wilds, offering to lend him his car during lunch period. Wilds then drops Syed back off at school where he has a free period and then arrives late to his psychology class. It started at 12.50 p.m., but he entered at 1.27 p.m. as his teacher notes. After class, he goes to the library to check his email and chats with friend Asia McLean. McLean's an important person and witness. Then he goes to track practice. Wilds picks him up and the two go to a friend's house. There, it's when he's at the friend's house that Officer Scott Adcock calls Syed asking if he knew where Lee was. The student told the official that he was supposed to get a home ride from the victim, but he got detained at school and felt that she just got tired of waiting for him and left. And that's according to a 2019 appeal. Syed then picks up food on his way to meet his dad at the mosque for evening prayers. Meanwhile, Wilde's version of the day changed throughout interviews and testimony. So this is the friend he has to borrow the car from. This is the friend that he's with after school. This guy is a major problem in his original conviction at trial. In he's his, the one that testified against him, right? Mm -hmm. Yeah. In his testimony at the second trial, Wilds says that he and Syed drove to Security Square Mall and claims that Syed reportedly told him he was going to kill Lee. That afternoon, he says that Syed asked him to pick him up at Best Buy, where Syed knows him, shows him Lee's body in the trunk of her car. They leave the car at a park and ride lot. That night, they bury Lee's body in Lincoln Park, Lincoln, Lincoln Park, and leave her car in a residential parking lot. As for Lee's family, all they knew was that she didn't come show up to pick up her cousin, which is when they reported her missing. Classmates last saw her leaving school at 2.15 p.m. On February 9th, 1999, about almost a month later, Lee's body is found in Lincoln Park. Maintenance worker Alonzo Sellers, known as Mr. S on Serial, claimed that he was drinking a 22-ounce Budweiser while driving when he made a pit stop. He had to go to the bathroom, so he pulled over and he went further into the woods so no one could see him. And when questioned about that, why he would go so far into the woods, uh, he walked 127 feet into the woods to use the restroom. It's because he had a previous record as an alleged streaker. Autopsy reports uh, later show that Lee was strangled, and he discovered her when he was getting ready to urinate. He looked down, and he saw something that looked like hair, something that was covered by the dirt, and he looked again, and that's when he saw what looked like a foot. Three days later, anonymous calls informed the police to look into Syed. 
Two anonymous phone calls telling, told the police to look into Lee's ex-boyfriend as a possible suspect. And there was a reward for $3,075 from the Crime Stoppers for information on the case leading to the indictment against Syed. It was about two weeks later that Syed is arrested, and it was an hour and a half after Lee's car was found. Syed's arrested in his home. He's 17 at the time, but he's charged with first-degree murder as an adult. And the old brother at the time, older brother of Heyman Lee, who was 16 at the time, and he was speaking for his grandparents and his mom, told the Baltimore Sun that the news provided some closure and some peace, but they were shocked. Quote, and this is from the same brother who's filed the appeal decades later. Quote, we were kind of surprised because she told us he was one of her best friends, he said. March 1st, 1999, McLean writes Syed a letter. Just after his arrest, McLean, who is the friend, Asia McLean, wrote a letter to Syed detailing talking to him in the library on January 13th. On December 15th, 1999, a mistrial is declared. And then the second trial begins in January. I'm just kind of looping back to the procedure here. And he's convicted in February 20, on February 25th, 2000. He's found guilty. He was calm in handcuffs as they were being put on him. And he said, I'll be all right. I have faith in the Lord. I know I didn't kill her. The Lord knows I didn't kill her, the Baltimore Sun reported. McLean didn't testify in that trial. March 25th, 2000, McLean writes an affidavit. Family friend and attorney, uh, Rabia Chaudhry, asked McLean to write an affidavit after Syed is convicted. And then it goes through, again, some details leading into multiple appeals, post-conviction relief, then serial comes in into play in 2014. And November 6, 2015, the post-conviction relief is reopened, and it's reopened to take into account McLean's new testimony, new cell phone data, allegations of ineffective assistance of counsel, as well as prosecutorial misconduct. DNA was part of that as well, Pete. And June 30th, 2016, Syed is granted a new trial. Eventually, the prosecution in 2022 uh, seeks to have the conviction vacated. Everyone's on board except Lee's family. And now Lee's family wants to get in the way of that vacated conviction because the brother wasn't there in person. He was there by Zoom. So with that factual background, just to loop it back, the, the basis for the vacated conviction is the evidence wasn't sufficient to maintain this conviction. Lee's brother is not a witness to the murder. So why would his position get in the way of a vacated sentence of someone that the evidence doesn't support to maintain a conviction on for a lifetime, a vacated a conviction, not sentence, but that leads to a life sentence in prison? Why does, why does the law allow for that? Why is there a procedural distinction of Lee's brother being present by Zoom versus Lee's brother being present in person? It doesn't take away his ability to make a position, but why would its position carry so much weight to get in the way of a vacated conviction on flawed evidence? It shouldn't. And that's our take on it. Absolutely. I mean, it's different. You know, victims and victims' families have a voice when somebody's going to be paroled from prison, for instance. Well, there, there's a viable conviction. They're, you know, they're trying to get out. And I have absolutely no quarrel with a family saying he shouldn't get out. You know, he killed my sister. Here, there's no conviction. So there's no victim. And, and well, there is a victim. There's no victim of Syed. So it's, you know, it, it's twisted that, you know, that if, if a prosecutor agrees that somebody should be let free, that there shouldn't be a conviction, that it can be held up by um, a family member of, of uh, the person who was murdered. This, this quote, uh, I think, sums it up. Syed's lawyers say the ruling jeopardizes prosecutors' discretion to dismiss cases and calls into question the role of victims in legal determinations like vacating convictions. Um, that's from the Baltimore Sun article. And that's absolutely right. And, um, I, you know, I don't know whether the guy did it or not. All I do know is that Maryland doesn't think that, um, that they should... Um, move forward with his conviction, they've identified two other suspects. I don't know who they are. And, he, you know, the, the, the procedural 
mechanism there is is completely twisted. And sometimes justice doesn't mean guilty. It really doesn't. And I do want to acknowledge this. Sometimes it, it might sound that we're not a proponent of victims having a say in a criminal case. And that's not at all what we're trying to get across here. We're trying to put into context when the say becomes uneven, uneven handed. Um, at least I represent many victims of crimes uh, privately. It's not something I promote, but it is something I do. And I do think that victims have a say and should have a say in certain ways, especially if uh, a crime is committed against a, a loved one of theirs. They might have a say in how they want the criminal process to go in a rehabilitative way. They might have a say whether or not they don't want the charges to go that way, or they might have a say into the sentence. What sentence do they think would be fair? They have a say, it gives weight, but ultimately the discretion is to the DA's office and to the lawyers to find the right balance and for the court to apply the law. So in this case, when Heyman Lee's brother is inserting himself to get in the way of a vacated conviction, it just seems totally off tilt and unfair and misplaced. All right. Well, that's it for episode 30 of Subject to Cross. We'll be back uh, momentarily. Signing off. Bye.